my name is Betsy King. I'm with the Hospi Corporation and the Macy Catheter. I'm the clinical educator and one of the RNs on the team. Uh, thanks for joining us today for the second in our uh, webinars by Dr. Nancy Trimble on dementia. Um, today we are coming to you from Ohio's Hospice of Dayton where um, and Nancy is on staff. I uh, just want a, a few little logistics before we get started. Um, we will be providing one CE credit for all the nurses uh, who are attending today and are able to attend for this full session. After the webinar is over, you will receive a, an email from us. There will be a link to an evaluation that you will need to complete in order to, be, to receive the CE. And you can expect to receive that in a one to two business days um, after you complete the evaluation. So uh, with that being said, uh, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Nancy Trimble, who will be our presenter today. Uh, Nancy's a nurse practitioner for Ohio's Hospice, uh, a not-for-profit hospice that's located in Dayton, Ohio. She works in clinical administration as a clinical team liaison. In her role as a clinical liaison, she oversees evaluation visits, she runs interdisciplinary teams, and provides geriatric consultation to staff care recipients, and other community entities. Um, this is the second in our series. If you were fortunate enough to have um, joined us for her first session, uh, you know that you're in for a real treat because she is an absolute subject man uh, uh, expert in this, in this field. So Nancy, thanks so much for being here today. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Um, we also will be doing Q&As uh, after the session. Um, if you have questions um, that, you want, that you've sent in previously or you'd like to submit right now, if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, there's a button that says Q&A and you can type your question in. So we'll be answering those, some of them uh, in the presentation time and then some of them afterwards. Okay, all right, Nancy. Good afternoon and Welcome to all of you across the country. Uh, we're going to talk today about some very specifics in dementia care, uh, and that's why it's called dementias, Dimensions in Dementia. Uh, that's my disclosure. I don't have any, and I may speak a little bit about uh, medications as far as off-label use. Uh, you can see our objectives for today, uh, emphasizing dementia as a terminal illness, when to start a hospice discussion, and some of the basic behavioral interventions uh, for difficult behaviors in the dementia patient. This is one of my favorite slides. Uh, when Thorazine first came out, uh, this was a, uh, a poster put out by Smith, Klein, and French uh, for Thorazine for senile agitation, of which there are not really any specific diagnoses. Uh, being a senior myself, I don't have senile agitation. I may have annoyance. So this is just kind of uh, how we saw older people a very long time ago. I'm using Alzheimer's disease today as the representative dementia because it's the most common. Um, many of the things I'm gonna speak about today certainly can uh, be applied to any of the other dementias, which I did cover in a previous webinar. Uh, it's also important that when we talk about the different dementias, uh, and some of the, the pathology, uh, we really need to teach our families and our colleagues about the disease and how it progresses and why some of the interventions don't particularly work for dementia. So we've got a, an age-related disease and it is one of those diseases that is progressive and there right now is no known cure for it all we have is symptom management, although uh, the frontier in research uh, is changing almost every day as far as what's going on uh, in uh, Alzheimer's research. Uh, and when we talk about this disease, we're really talking about the brain losing brain cells. Um, we have the axons and dendrites uh, beginning to tangle as they are uh, destroyed, uh, and then we really see a a change in acetylcholine production, as well as some other neurotransmitters. But Alzheimer's disease is primarily a, uh, an acetylcholine-related disease as far as neurotransmitters are concerned. The stages of Alzheimer's disease um, 
you can see on your screen. Um, the early stages of it tend to be with memory loss. And it's usually short-term memory that begins um, the, the disease itself. Uh, and what's unfortunate is that that is the same thing that happens in normal aging, that one of the signs of normal aging is short-term memory loss. So it's very common for families to um, accommodate to the, the loss of cognitive function, particularly in the early and early middle stages of the disease. The middle stages, we begin to see things like executive function decline. Um, this is seen where we have patients who now can't pay their bills. Um, they are ordering things off the television. Uh, if they're still driving, uh, they may get lost if their usual route uh, is disrupted in some way and they can often end up in another state or uh, in uh, an accident somewhere. Uh, the later parts of moderate stage dementia, we begin to see problems with hygiene, with being able to pick out and dress in clothing. We may see some problems with um, uh, incontinence, uh, not all the time. Uh, it can be very intermittent, it usually starts with urinary incontinence and goes on to uh, bowel incontinence. The later severe stages are considered the terminal stage, and this is the area that hospice is involved in. And I, I've put on uh, the screen just the kind of basics that you um, see for hospice eligibility for approximately a six months prognosis. They need to be a seven on the FAST scale, uh, and in stage seven, A, B, C, D, uh, and E, and F, uh, we see changes very specific to those um, particular areas. It's very linear. So these folks don't go back and forth on the FAST scale. Uh, a, start, a and B start out with um, problems with language. We have uh, less than 12 words. We may have um, repetition of a sentence over and over again, um, but there's really no sophisticated language left in A and B. C, the patient now is beginning to lose the ability to ambulate independently. We see falls at this time and we see a lot of wall and furniture walking. Um, and this is where families often want to start therapy, uh, which is usually not uh, very helpful because the person has already lost the ability to learn at this stage of the game. Um, 7D is the loss of core strength, and we begin to see patients who cannot hold themselves up without some support of a jerry chair, a wheelchair, a posture mate, some way to keep them in an upright position. Uh, and you always find these folks leaning. And 7E um, e is the loss of the ability to smile. Uh, so oftentimes, dementia patients, if you smile at them, they will smile back. Uh, when the loss of the smile occurs, that's an important um, point to make in your documentation, as all of the areas are. And 7F is the inability to hold the head up. And often at this time, we are beginning to see uh, long periods of sleeping, inability of, uh, to stay awake during um, uh, meal time. Uh, they may fall asleep in the middle of a visit with a family member, and so on and so forth. The other thing that we also, also look at as far as hospice eligibility are complications that go along with the disease. Uh, respiratory infections, frequent urinary tract infections, they've been hospitalized for septicemia uh, from another infection source. They're developing decubitus ulcers, usually in the stage three and four areas. Uh, they have fevers, They're in a, they have inability to eat, to maintain caloric intake. But the other thing to also take note of is we may not see a lot of those complications, but we may see a rapid progression in the disease itself. And if the patient is deteriorating physically and cognitively, cognitively very quickly, uh, you can usually uh, justify admitting them to hospice care, even if they have not had multiple hospitalizations. 
if we take a look at uh, dementia in general, and this is, this is true pretty much for most of the dementias, is that we see shrinkage of the brain, we see a loss of white matter, we can see loss of gray matter, the sulci become very open, the ventricle becomes very enlarged, and particularly in Alzheimer's disease, this is not consistent with regular aging progression of the brain. And if you notice, uh, highlighted there in the boxes, show you language and memory uh, and, and the losses that you can see on the Alzheimer's brain uh, are very specific in the areas of memory and language. And language is not just the spoken word, it is the ability of the brain to process uh, all symbolic um, language that we have. So one of the things to remember that in, in almost any dementia is the processor is broken. And I always use the was wrong. You can yell at it, you can bang on it, and it's not gonna fix the processor. The same thing holds true with Alzheimer's disease. Most therapies do not work because the processor is so broken that it cannot learn. So this is progressive brain damage. It's important also to remember that the sensors are not. So the sensory inputs are still coming into the brain, but the brain doesn't know what to do with those sensations. So you may have a patient who screams in the middle of a bowel movement. It's not because the bowel movement is particularly painful. It's because they cannot process the sensation of having um, their, their stretch around the anus and the movement of stool. And that's important when we're talking about pain control. The other thing to remember is all behavior has meaning. Uh, it may not have any meaning to you, but it has meaning to the patient. And often the troublesome behaviors in dementia come from fear or some unmet need. And we'll get into that in just a few minutes. We can also look at um, Alzheimer's disease at the cellular level. And I find that pictures are very helpful when you're trying to describe the disease to a family member. You know, all we ever see when we see someone with dementia is what they look like on the outside. And we have expectations for their behavior because we've known them for a very long time. But if you take a look at what neurons look like as the disease progresses, you can see that we lose the ability of communication between nerve cells. The dendrites and axites, axons begin to shrivel and destruction occurs. We see that the cell body is now losing its uh, integrity, so it cannot process whatever's coming into it. And we have uh, a large amount of amyloid plaque and those remaining uh, uh, neuritic uh, fibrils begin to tangle. And when this happens, there's no regeneration. We also can look at some dementia trajectories here. And if you look, the orange line that goes kind of in a steady slope is Alzheimer's disease. And it is a pretty linear disease. Now certainly patients can get worse if they have an infection or they have an injury, but they really never come back to baseline. If we look at vascular dementia uh, or multi-infarct dementia, it has its stair steps. It will go along for a while and patients will be fairly stable. Then they'll have some incident that it might be an infection or that might be worsening of their um, uh, cerebral vascular flow, something along those lines. And so they progress uh, in a plateau-like, step-like fashion. And then if you look at the, the blue line, that's dementia with Lewy bodies. And we probably can also say that that's pretty representative of frontotemporal dementia as well. And it has its ups and downs, and they can be rather dramatic, uh, which makes this disease very, the dementia with Lewy bodies and with frontotemporal, very hard to, um, ex to project, pro pro uh, to, um, project what is the next step in the disease. One thing that you should be able to take from the, this particular graph is that all cognitive status declines and it declines over time. There is no return to baseline. 
So when we look at assessing a dementia patient uh, at any stage, we really need to look at um, their physical abilities because many of our folks with dementia, particularly Alzheimer's dementia, uh, as an age-related disease, have other physical comorbidities. They may have osteoarthritis, uh, they may have um, had a stroke in the past, uh, they may have rheumatoid, they may have heart disease, kidney disease. So we really need a good assessment of our dementia patient from the physical standpoint. We also need to look at their cognitive abilities. Uh, the MMSE and the FAST scales are two scales that can be used to look at cognition. Uh, we can also use uh, depressive scales because frequently folks with any type of dementia may have uh, a comorbid uh, depression, especially when we're talking about Lewy body dementia or the dementia of Parkinson's disease. We need a good emotional assessment, not only of the dementia patient, but of the family, because this is going to be an interactive uh, issue. Look at the environment that the dementia patient is in. This is particularly important in the advanced stages because if a dementia patient is placed in a very noisy, uh, chaotic environment, we see more behaviors uh, that can occur when they cannot process all of that information. It's like one of us being in a very, very noisy restaurant, trying to have a conversation with someone at the table, as well as reading the menu and trying to make a decision on what we want to order. It becomes very difficult to do. Um, I mentioned the fast scale. The other thing to look at is in looking at patients uh, who may have other problems is look at uh, the geriatric triad. Um, the short form is called PUS. Do we have involvement of the pulmonary system? Are they getting frequent um, pneumonias because of aspiration? Uh, urinary, are they having urinary tract infections, particularly women? Uh, this is a, a big problem with incontinence. And are we having skin issues? Is, is skin breakdown happening uh, or are our skin breakdowns progressing in the stages of decubitus ulcers? Look at medications. Uh, frequently in the age-related patient, we have a multitude of medications. One thing we don't know is in the aging patient, how all of these medications may interact in an aging system, particularly in those folks who are classed as frail elderly, the 85 and above crowd. Uh, part of the review of medications is also important to see what is really necessary at this stage of the disease process. We need to evaluate for special equipment. Do we need bedside commodes? Do we need jerry chairs for support, uh, high-backed wheelchairs, uh, or any other assistive equipment to keep the individual safe. And then we always have the ethical question, when should we stop medications that are specific to the diseases that that patient has? And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit toward the end of this presentation. When we look at why dementia patients have behaviors, uh, there's some very common causes. Number one is physical discomfort. I've had more than one patient who has been combative, particularly when they've been moved. Uh, and it's because they've got concurrent osteoarthritis. Uh, they've got immobility problems. They may have some uh, arthralgia, arthritis, uh, myalgia. Uh, oftentimes, this combativeness will stop when you schedule something very simple like scheduled acetaminophen uh, instead of using PRN medications for pain. Um, your dementia patient is not often going to be able to tell you that they hurt. Overstimulation, this cannot be underestimated. This often will occur in dining rooms. So as the dementia progresses, the person who is in the dining room uh, may be overwhelmed with the smell of food, of the visual uh, uh, things going on around them, as well as food, the noise, there may be people coming and going depending on whether they're being served uh, in a congregate meal setting and so on. Uh, as dementia progresses, 
patients can tolerate less and less stimulation. And I tell families that their world will get smaller. That is not a problem for the patient, it's a problem for the family because they're thinking that their loved one um, is thinking as they are. Unfamiliarity, we often see, uh, even with the elder who does not have dementia, when they're moved from a familiar place, they have problems with adjustment. Uh, in the dementia patient, when their rooms are changed or they, they move from uh, assisted living to nursing home or from home to assisted living, we see change in behavior. When uh, caregivers change, that can trigger some problems. And when the patient cannot recognize family members uh, or they cannot recognize themselves in a mirror, that can cause uh, upset in their behaviors. Uh, if any of you uh, on this program uh, have never been frustrated in your life, uh, please send me uh, a chat about that because mm -hmm. I want to meet you. Uh, all of us get frustrated. It's part of the normal condition of human beings. It's also normal in dementia patients. Uh, their frustration changes over time as their memory loss progresses. But they may be having a bad day just like you have a bad day. It's no reason to jump on medications or to get a urine for your analysis uh, if it doesn't um, remain after you know, a day. And we need to be cognizant of any medication changes, either medicines that are added or medications that are subtracted. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about medication a little bit uh, into this program. The typical behaviors that we see, and there are more behaviors, but these are the ones that either trigger, trigger issues uh, with surveyors, uh, they can cause problems with families, and they can cause problems um, with just tolerance of caregivers. Agitation, aggression, wandering, and repetition. Let's look at these individually. Before we get into them, one of the things that I use as a three-step approach in assessing behaviors. First of all, we want to identify and examine what the behavior is. Is it harmful? Um, for example, uh, if you have a patient, a male patient, who is masturbating, that's not particularly harmful unless he's doing it uh, on Thanksgiving Day in the dining room with all the family and everyone present. If he's doing it in his own room, it's not harmful. Uh, and again, it's a regressive behavior that we see. So we don't need to make a lot out of behaviors if they're not particularly harmful. It's just the problem of the disease. What happened before the behavior triggered? I'm sure all of you have had the experience of family members who have come in and the patient cannot recognize them anymore. And they start in on a, hi mom, what's my name? Who am I mom? come on, you can tell me. And what happens is they get very, very agitated because they cannot recognize that individual and they cannot process what that individual is trying to get at other than it's becoming very aggravated. So we really have to see what happened before the behavior was triggered. What happened after the behavior occurred? How did you react? If you have a patient who is a fall risk and you see them stand up out of their wheelchair and they have dementia, yelling at them down the hall is only going to often scare them and cause them to fall rather than calling their name and say, I'm coming and then move toward them. We also have to consider, as I said before, are we having problems because of medication changes? Is the patient uh, coming down with an infection? or is their underlying chronic illness, such as their kidney disease or their heart disease getting worse, which again, may trigger a delirium. We have to explore our solutions. Are we meeting the basic needs of the patient? Is the patient hungry? Are they comfortable? Is the environment too hot or too cold? Is the environment too noisy? Are they downright tired because they've been sitting in a chair for three hours. You know, are we meeting those needs appropriately? Can we adapt the surroundings for the patient? 
oftentimes institutionally, the, the patient has to adapt to our surroundings. That's not a good way to deal with folks with dementia because they do not adapt well. Decreasing noise often calms people and decreasing the ambient light in a room may be helpful. Look at how you approach or how you react to these folks. It becomes second nature to many of us and families who are tired can often move into abusive situations because they've had to deal with this over and over again. And it's not because they're particularly abusive people. They've just reached the end of their rope. And we reached the end of our ropes too with these folks. We have to find a way to be calm and supportive whenever we're dealing with folks with dementia. If you're working in a team setting, do try to talk with your team members to see what responses helped the most. Sometimes family can tell you they're not a morning person. So if you haul them out of bed at five o'clock in the morning, you're probably going to have a very angry, upset, and combative dementia patient because they're not a morning person. So are our responses helpful? Do we need to look at other causes for behavior? Look at what we can do differently and really help family to be part of our team and part of our plan of care for these folks. So they're reacting the same way that we're reacting. You'll see some repetition as I go through here because um, it's frequently the same things over and over again that trigger issues with folks with dementia. Um, the causes, you know, I've, I've talked about, uh, we do have family members at times who just love to either redecorate rooms or to rearrange rooms because they're bored. Um, I really try to encourage families if a patient um, cannot process change very well. It's not the time to redecorate the room for every holiday or move things around because you as the visitor are getting bored with how things are. Consistency uh, is the key to dealing with uh, any dementia in, at any stage. So when we uh, assess for problems, you know, one of the things that we can do after we've assessed it is look at, you know, what we can do, uh, calm the environment, obviously limit caffeine and stimulants. Um, a big thing is offer rest. Uh, families are very often insistent that they want their loved ones up and out of bed and out of a room. Well, you know, if you're 85 or 90 uh, and you sit in a chair or you sit in one place for two or three hours, you are going to tire. So short naps are very, very helpful. And they may prevent some of the sundownings we see in the late afternoon. Make sure that they have privacy, uh, that we have some degree of exercise, particularly in those folks who are still mobile. Uh, get into soothing rituals, uh, aromatherapy, therapy, massage, um, low light, uh, white noise or soft music uh, can help. And use gentle reminders uh, as they are appropriate to the patient. And then look at environmental triggers. Um, frequently, when we are in an institutional setting, uh, designs are not real good. So we have to help uh, those folks who um, are institutionalized to be as creative as possible to avoid some of the environmental triggers. In one assisted living that I dealt with, we had a lady who was extremely di distractible during a meal yet she wanted to be in the dining room because that was what, where you ate and that was what was appropriate to her. So we put her in the dining room where she could hear what was going on, but we faced her into the hallway where there was little stimulation. And she was able for a very long time to feed herself and to stay focused while being in the dining room, but not being uh, distracted or overstimulated. So you have to get creative. And we really need to look at how we are addressing comfort. You know, deal with pain first. 
assume that some of the behaviors that you see are pain related. You know, acetaminophen uh, is very simple. Are they hungry? Thirst is a late sign. It breaks my heart when I walk in and I have an elderly dementia patient who says to me, I'm so thirsty. Can you give me a drink of water? I already know that that patient is quite dry uh, and is very uncomfortable. Are they constipated? Um, are they having bladder problems, particularly men who may have enlarged prostates? You know, any uh, anticholinergic drug may cause urinary retention with those folks. Are they tired? Uh, is the environment too cold or too warm? Um, and are they coming down with uh, a urinary tract infection or pneumonia? We also need to be sensitive that uh, particularly the generation that we are all dealing with, uh, which is World War II uh, and Korea and Vietnam, but particularly World War II in Korea, um, we run into patients who either have undiagnosed PTSD from the service, or we may run into folks who have been physically or sexually abused. And, uh, and this comes out when we're giving personal care. Most of those things were kept behind closed doors and were not dealt with in that generation. So we may have to be sensitive to the fact that there may have been some problems and that we can't fix at this stage of the game. And we have to be creative again in how we're going to deal with them. Believe me, it's much easier to deal with a veteran with PTSD than it is to deal with um, a little old lady who has been sexually abused by multiple members of her family. We also need to simplify our tasks and routines and stick to them. That's why a plan of care is, is essential for caregivers of all uh, levels, whether we're dealing with family members or whether we're dealing with um, caregivers in an institu institutional setting. We also need to respond correctly. Many times, if you listen to um, the response from a, a person with dementia, pay attention to the emotion that you hear more than what they're saying or they're not saying. That's important for us as well. The patient with dementia are, is going to pick up more on our emotional presentation of words than the actual words. One of the phrases that I always use with uh, with folks um, when I approach them is that you are safe with me. And I do not touch them um, before I've engaged them uh, and can see through their eyes, through their body posture, um, you know, are they very frightened, in which case I'm not going to touch them until we can get to a point of comfort. Always check yourself check your voice volume. You do not want to corner a dementia patient with agitation. We never want to use restraint uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. And most of the time, agitation can be dealt with without restraint of any kind. Do not criticize, argue, ignore, or shame. Uh, particularly when we're dealing with untrained caregivers, uh, frequently dementia patients are treated as children who have done something bad, uh, and even family members who are horrendously embarrassed by what their family member may be doing, um, resort to uh, criticism, they try to argue them out of it, or they shame them because of the response, because of their embarrassment. You know, the governors are all off as far as uh, what we say and what we do. So we may end up uh, particularly in our World War II uh, era folks uh, before civil rights, that we have uh, racial prejudice uh, or religious prejudice that come out. It's important to realize there is really nothing behind that at this stage of the disease and not to take it personally. Um, Obviously, if we don't deal with agitation, we're going to end up with aggression. And this is where many people and many patients can uh, become injured. One of the biggest um, things I see as far as aggression, it's being driven by fear. 
Um, and what would you do if you were fearful for your life? You would strike out, you would try to get away, you would be as aggressive as you could be in protecting yourself. And this often happens when we're doing personal care uh, or there's a lot of people that are not familiar to the patient in their environment. Um, patients can get very fatigued. Uh, part of the progression of the disease is their arousal system begins to fail, so they're sleeping all the time. And for them, oftentimes that is a very comfortable place to be, is sleeping. We need to look at medication side effects. I have found in hospice practice, because uh, lorazepam is one of our go-to drugs, that there are more than one elderly person who has an idiosyncratic reaction to lorazepam. And it's not across the class. They may respond well if they're having anxiety to aprazolam or clonazepam, where they don't respond well to lorazepam. So just be um, aware that some of the side effects of the drugs that we normally use uh, may be uh, idiosyncratic. Many patients who uh, feel very lost, um, and again, feeling lost leads to fear. So, you know, sometimes we have to have, you know, someone sit with them, say that they're safe. Um, you know, if you have another patient who just loves to sit with a person, that may be helpful. Um, avoid too many questions at once. This is going to confuse the individual and can raise agitation to an aggressive level. If you're angry, I can guarantee that the patient is going to end up angry or very stressed. Uh, we've seen this happen with MRDD clientele. When a staff member comes in upset about something at home, it creates havoc through the entire ward. So our patients do tune into our emotional states. And if you're being negative, if you're being critical, if you're in a hurry and you're very task oriented, you're in the wrong place for dealing with someone with dementia. So figure out what started it all. Focus on the feelings that you're getting from the patient, not the facts or the words. Because what you may be getting that we see oftentimes with folks with stroke is you're going to hear them cursing the same thing over and over again or saying the same word, and it's not the word, it's how they're saying it. One hint that I will give you in trying to remain calm is if you've watched The Dog Whisperer with Caesar Milan, um, one of the ways he deals with aggressive dogs is to remain calm. And families are always taken aback. How did you do that? And it's because he calmed himself. Don't worry about the assertive part, just think about being calm. Um, so if you are angry or you are upset, find a way to become calm before you walk into a room or you're going to pass a medication for that particular individual. Try to limit distractions and try for relaxing activities, shifting focus to something else, or else just decrease the level of behavior by stepping back and say, I'll come back later as long as they're in a safe place. The other thing to look at is your position and stance. Many times people are injured because you're standing in a place where you're going to get hit. So if you stand in, directly in front of someone, you're asking to get hit, kicked, pinched. If you stand behind someone, you're looking to get hit. So be careful how you stand and make sure that you are watching where all the limbs are at any given point in time. Sometimes it takes two people to do personal care because one needs to watch arms and legs while the other one takes care of the business. The last thing as far as behaviors that really drive us all up a wall is repetition. The typical, when am I going home? Where's my husband? Where's Bob? 
you name it, and you hear it over and over and over again. Frequently, these folks are looking for some degree of comfort, some familiarity or stability or security in the situation. How do we respond to these folks? Many people respond by giving them some fact, like the bus isn't running today, or you are home already. Remember, these folks lose executive left brain function, and that's where all facts are found. So giving facts don't stop this behavior. They'll be back in five minutes and ask exactly the same thing again. So what is the emotion behind what they're asking? If you can figure that out, then you've got a good way to respond. Turn their action into an activity. So let's say they say to you, I want to go home. Instead of saying you are home, this is your home, say, tell me what is what was the, the favorite room in your house? Describe your house to me. I'd like to really know what that house is all about. Um, we're then moving into the right brain area, uh, the sensory area, and even if the patient gives you to go home feedback loop. And then you can have a conversation, even if it's limited. Stay calm and be patient. Um, again, going back to the dog whisperer. Sometimes you do have to provide an answer uh, while you're trying to work on the feedback loop. Uh, I, I watched uh, a family member uh, take uh, her daughter uh, was there with her mother who had dementia in an assisted living. And mom said, uh, I want to go home. The daughter, instead of saying, this is home, took her by the arm and said, come on, let's go home. And walked her to her apartment. So she didn't give a fact. She engaged the patient. Um, did yeah. Tell that the audio just stopped. So sorry. Uh, just starting off when um, the daughter talked about um, what, how the daughter. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, we had a, uh, a patient in an assisted living, and the daughter had been visiting, and mom said, uh, I want to go home. Take me home. Uh, instead of answering directly, the daughter took her by the arm, arm in arm, and said, let's go home, and walked her down the hallway. Um, that was that was so important because she didn't give her a fact. Uh, she accompanied her to her apartment and then could move into the apartment and talk about the familiar things that were there that were her, part of her home. Providing an answer, sometimes you have to just say whatever the fact is while you're trying to figure out why the patient is being repetitious. Um, in advanced dementia, memory aids don't wor work very well. In earlier dementia, it does. So, you know, leaving lists sometimes helps people remember uh, if they're still able to read and comprehend. But when you're into the later moderate and severe stages, memory aids are not helpful at all. We want to make sure in wandering that safety is paramount. Um, Things that I tell folks who have dementia units is that safety uh, is paramount. And if you've got exit seekers, make the doors look like something else. This is a, a wonderful time to have your high school art class come in and paint murals on the door. Or continue a, a chair rail right along the door so it begins to look like a continuation of the wall. We want to make sure that patients have adequate identification so if they do elope, that they can be returned. Uh, patients with dementia do get bored, uh, and they will tell you that, and bored patients get into trouble. So we often have to find frequent uh, activities of maybe no less than 30 minutes uh, to engage them. And regular exercise if they're still ambulatory, and if they're not ambulatory, you may have to exercise them to make sure that they are comfortable and um, they fatigue appropriately. Um, memory is gone 
And what I can want to point out here is that please engage the, the senses and emotion. That's what's going to give you the most amount of bang for your buck when you're trying to care for these folks. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides when we're talking about dementia. Whatever happened to our sexual relations? I don't know. I don't think we even got a Christmas card from them this year. Uh, which side of the couch are you sitting on or are your family sitting on? Because that's the problem, the disconnect we have when we're trying to deal with someone with dementia is that we don't understand one another. Now I'm going to move into some of the medications and we're going to clip along fairly quickly here. Um, pharmacologic therapy, the standby for Alzheimer's disease has been cholinesterase inhibitors, galantamine, denepacel, rivastigmine. Um, these are cholinesterase inhibitors. They act on acetylcholine at the uh, neuronal synapse. Uh, these drugs are really only appropriate in Alzheimer's dementia. I find that they get prescribed for Lewy body, they get prescribed for vascular, and when you ask families, did the drug help frequently, what you hear is no. Well, that's because the dementia is not Alzheimer's. Cholinesterase inhibitors really only help keep people out of nursing homes for about two years. The disease does progress in spite of cholinesterase inhibitors. So there comes a time, and I'll get to this later, about when do you stop these drugs. Uh, MDNDA inhibitors, the memetidine is really the only one we have at this particular moment in time, uh, works differently. It protects nerve cells uh, against glutamate, uh, and that may decrease the damage. Now, memetidine, when it's given without one of the cholinesterase inhibitors, may increase agitation. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, if, if you have a patient who cannot take the cholinesterase inhibitor, uh, some neuro, uh, neurologists will prescribe uh, memenidine without the other drugs. Just be aware that sometimes, you know, what you see in agitation afterwards is because of that. Um, there's not a lot of consistent evidence out there that the cholinesterase inhibitors and memenidine um, benefit advanced disease. There are some anecdotal reports with small studies that show that sometimes um, rivastigmine um, may help with behavior, but it really doesn't change the progression of the disease. Other pharmacologic therapy that uh, we are going to be seeing in these patients uh, our antidepressants. We frequently see this used in Lewy body dementia because it's a frontal lobe disease or in the dementia of Parkinson's disease because Parkinson's is a frontal lobe disease and that is where dopamine is active. So oftentimes uh, antidepressants are helpful. Um, the SSRIs such as Celexa or Lexapro are generally safe. Um, but again, they do have their side effects in elder patients. So, you know, just be aware that when you start one of those that you have to watch carefully what's going on. Uh, in particularly angry, aggressive patients, sometimes anticonvulsants as mood stabilizers will be helpful. Um, Depakote is one drug that has been um, approved for mood stabilization as well as being an anti-convulsant. Uh, we've had fairly good results with the agitated aggressive behavior that sometimes comes in the later stages of particularly Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. It's got a fairly safe side effect profile, but you do need to check liver functions periodically uh, depending on your particular patient and institution. Um, it doesn't require a large dose of Depakote. Usually what I recommend is starting uh, 125 at bedtime and then um, titrate from there. Antipsychotics are really a hot topic these days because of CMS guidelines. Um, I'm a firm believer in using antipsychotics for psychosis, not for agitated behavior. They're not indicated for agitated behavior. 
Um, however, if the patient is having a psychosis, they're hallucinating, they're delusional, that is an appropriate time to use an antipsychotic. Um, risperidol, quetiapine, hal uh, haloperidol uh, are fine, but usually we need to schedule those. We don't use them as PRNs. Um, realize that quetiapine is particularly sedating, so you may have more fall risks. Uh, Haldol is not to be used in Lewy body dementia or in the dementia of Parkinson's disease because of neuroleptic syndrome. Uh, quetiapine usually works better in, that, in those folks. And we do see psychosis in those dementias. Benzodiazepines, um, you know, again, if you've got an, an, an anxious patient, then maybe benzodiazepines are helpful, but they are fall risk drugs. So you have to um, balance those uh, against falls. And then really look at medications that can cause cognitive impairment, especially anticholinergics. And two of the big areas or uh, drug classes are the drugs for bladder control and Benadryl. Um, those are frequently found uh, in you know, older individuals. Rule of thumb, and that's why it's in red, start one medication at a time at a lower dose than is often recommended and increase slowly. When you play around with a lot of medicines at one time, you have no clue as to what's going on. Non-pharmacologic therapy um, is really where we start before we start pharmacologic interventions, except for the anticholinesterase inhibitors, is treat the problem. So if they're hungry, if they're thirsty, if they need to be toileted, if they're in pain, deal with that first. You'll find that your behaviors improve. Use short answers uh, or short questions to seek information. And then allow a lot of time to process. If you have to repeat the question, repeat it exactly as you ask it the first time. Otherwise, the patient has to start all over again to figure out how to process that question. Um, when the patient appears frustrated or combative, again, dog whisperer time, gentle touch, soft tone, approach, calm, uh, and the things that I've, I've said before. These are, again, areas that I've covered. One of the things to remember is engage imagination rather than memory and use the sensory inputs, which, you know, again, music, aromatherapy, massage uh, are sometimes helpful for these folks. Okay, now we're going to switch gears and look at medications and when to stop them. Since uh, I'm a hospice person, I often have to have a conversation about stopping medications. Uh, some barriers is, you know, nobody wants to rock the boat, uh, particularly families, uh, because, you know, they are often very physician driven and that's all right. But there is frequently not enough time in a physician's office to discuss the pros and cons about continuing medications. So nobody wants to rock the boat and they leave everything the same. Direct-to-consumer marketing, pharmaceutical company advertising. Um, this is a big problem to deal, to deal with, particularly with families, uh, because it's very, very hard to sift through consumer marketing. You, you really have to know your stuff and, uh, and, and help families uh, and patients work through what's appropriate at the state, stage of their disease. Um, a lot of times providers do not keep up with the latest guidelines. You know, we're all pressed for time. So, you know, this is an area where you can shine is if you, you know, read uh, Medscape or you keep up with some of the, the information uh, that, that comes through Cochrane Re Review or OnBase, that will help you keep up with, with some of the, the things that are going on in dementia care. Um, families have hope that you know, they're gonna find something that will help their individual. And that's why we frequently see uh, folks with other types of dementia put, being put on Alzheimer's drugs. Um, we also have you know, providers, nurses, um, aides, housekeepers, other family members, 
over reliance on personal experience. Well, you know, when, when grandma did this, this is what we did. And by George, we're gonna do it for, you know, my aunt. Um, and there's very few RCTs out there, uh, randomized controlled trials. So how do we stop drugs if we've got all those barriers? First of all, let's start with a shared decision-making model. One of the things I do with particularly families and with, with uh, providers is what are the risks and benefits of the drugs that they're using? Um, the anticholinesterase inhibitors are not without risks. The antipsychotics are not without risks. So we, we look at those and say, you know, if we stop this or we add this, how will it benefit the patient and will the benefit outweigh the risk? Oftentimes family members don't realize that many of these drugs taken over a long period of time may have some, some problems, particularly denepocil and bradycardia. What are the family goals for care? Uh, I frequently hear, you know, I've got a difficult family, they just don't listen. And when I ask what is the family's goal, there is crickets and silence. So we, ask, we really have to find out what does the family expect. If the family expects their loved one to get up and dance and be back to normal, obviously that's a goal that's in the wrong place. If it's a goal that they want their loved ones to be safe and not suffer, then we can deal with that from the medication standpoint. I often suggest that we use a time-limited trial of starting or stopping drugs. That appeals to families with specific indications of when they should call. You know, we'll try this for three days. The case manager or the nurse is going to call me back. Or if they're home, I want you to call me or I will call you and we'll see what's going on. Um, we often have to deal with, you know, um, some alternative medications versus our dementia drugs. Um, and, and that gets into the area of, of you know, either the herbal supplements, uh, and sometimes our herbal, herbal supplements are causing problems with behaviors. So, you know, make sure you have a good list of medications. Um, the other thing that we have to look at when we're stopping drugs is also drugs for other problems. Uh, a common one are statins. Now, you know, cardiologists may disagree, but, you know, when we get to, you know, 80 and 90 years old, even though statins have anti-inflammatory uh, benefits, uh, if you have a problem getting required medications for that patient into them, a statin is not one that you're going to want to fiddle around with. So get rid of things like vitamins and calcium and statins and things that over a long period of time are really, or, or short period of time, are not really gonna have any benefit for them. It makes it easier to administer essential drugs that the patient may need for heart failure, for example. Um, if you're stopping drugs, there, particularly the dementia drugs, some, um, some people suggest tapering, others do not. The last um, information that came out from our pharmacist was that really you do not have to taper the drugs, but it doesn't hurt either way. So, you know, that's one thing not to argue about. Really inform the, the health team members of what the plan is and why drugs are being stopped. This is particularly for our um, caregivers who are less educated uh, in the area of pharma, uh, pharmacology. Um, often our, you know, our resident assistants in assisted living don't understand why we're doing some of the things that we do. Um, and, you know, deal with finances. Um, you know, dementia drugs it, for uh, the cholinesterase inhibitors and mimetidine, uh, out of pocket is going to be about $400 a month. So if families are having problems with finances, address it, you know, be realistic with it. Okay. We're about to the end of our time, so I'm going to pop through the hospice discussion really quickly. Um, I talked about it a little bit at the last one. Um, is number one, let's look at dementia as a terminal illness. We don't have anything that is really going to reverse the damage at this point in time. Um, 
there's not any therapy that's going to maintain functional status, particularly when we're in the late, later stages. And death often comes as a result of the functional problems of dementia. And at times we have to talk with families, you know, are we going to get to a point where we're not going to treat an infection, we're not going to worry about nutrition anymore, um, or are, you know, uh, acute end damage such as strokes. You know, we really have to talk with families about what other things may happen as we go along. Uh, I've talked about the referral criteria already, so I'm going to, you know, skip that one for you. It's really kind of got everything on there, but do look at the comorbid disease burden. Starting the conversation, start it before the patient loses decision-making capacity. Uh, this is my mantra for anyone who talks to me about dementia and advanced directives. It's always too soon until it's too late. Um, I refer you to the conversation project. It's on my list of references. Um, this is an excellent resource for you to start uh, a conversation for how a person with dementia wants to live out the rest of their lives. Many patients with dementia are already aware of what's going on early on. They may be anxious or afraid and they may deny or they may worry. So it's important that we talk with them about those things. Um, if the patient is denying, then what you can do is make it about you and your loved one. You know, mom, I'm getting older too. I've got to think about how my life wants, I want to live my life out if something happens. And then you can make it a co-discussion for the two of you. You both share your wishes. Um, if it's overwhelming, and, uh, and there might not be enough cognitive function left, what you can say to them is, you know, mom, if something happens, do you want me to make a decision for you if you can't speak for yourself? Oftentimes, that's all you have to say, and they're fine with that. Um, and try not to brush off their memory loss as getting old. Um, that, that's really, really important. Um, be concrete rather than abstract and open-ended. You know, mom, if I can't drink or swallow anymore, I don't want anybody to put a feeding tube in me. That's very, very concrete. And then you can say, mom, what do you think about something like that? Would you want something like that? Your conversation project will help you with all of that. And I, I recommend that very strongly. What's a good death? Well, you know, we want to be treated with compassion and respect, and so does the dementia patient. Um, being clean, comfortable, free of distressing symptoms. These are all terms that you can use when you are trying to figure out family goals. Uh, many patients uh, want to be in a familiar place. My father-in-law right now is almost 99, and he is in our hospice care. Um, one of the things we have to deal with with another family member is that she thinks he should go to a nursing home. His caregiver, one of his other daughters, said, he wants to be here, I can take care of it, and I'll tell you when I can't. And he's being kept in a familiar place where he's been for years and years. And having a caregivers who understand the disease and its symptoms and what we need to do to intervene. Uh, I won't tell you what uh, the healthcare system burdens are. You can read those at your own. Uh, but this is kind of the problem that we have with dementia. We've got a 10-minute appointment, and the patient with dementia goes in, and doctor says, or the nurse practitioner, or the PA says, how are you doing today? And what is the answer? I'm just fine. And the caregiver is losing his or her mind because everything is not fine. Um, and then you can look at the rest of them on the screen. Um, this is the other term I use besides you are safe with me, is letting families know that many of the symptoms that a dementia patient experiences is suffering. And we really need to relieve suffering. So 
many families go along with that. And, and when you tell them, you know, they are anxious or they're in pain and they are suffering, and your goal was that you wanted them comfort, comfortable and safe, then we need to use medication or something else for that. Um, force feeding is a big problem. Uh, particularly with families. They think that, you know, dying of starvation or malnutrition is absolutely, you know, horrible. And that's the way our society is. We have to teach families that when they force feed, they often increase episodes of pneumonia as well as anxiety. Um, this is for your reference, uh, a three-step mo model uh, method to high quality uh, end of life care. Um, you know, and, and where we're at as far as dementia. And this is my last slide for you. Uh, this is what I had on my last one. All behaviors have meaning, please remember that. And that's Greek for the processor is broken. Uh, we really, really need to remember those two things. And if we do, then we can do the rest of what's on that particular slide. And I think that is the end of it all for today. Just want to invite you all to um, our next webinar uh, with continuing education credits, which is going to be in honor of Veterans Day on November the 8th. We will have uh, Deborah Grassman, the president of Opus Peace, who many of you may know of, uh, who's done uh, just amazing work in the area of hospice care for veterans. She will be presenting um, a presentation on soul injury, uh, liberating unmourned loss and unforgiven guilt. So I invite you to sign up for that, as well as our monthly training webinars um, on the Macy Catheter. All of these uh, accesses you can find on macycatheter.com under the clinical corner webinars. So thank you again for joining us and thank you, Nancy, and we will look forward to seeing you next time.